The Nature of the Fun by David Foster Wallace Originally published in Fiction Writer Magazine, September 1998 The best metaphor I know of for being a fiction writer is Don DeLillo's Mao 2, where he describes a book in progress as a kind of hideously damaged infant that follows the writer around, forever crawling after the writer, dragging itself across the floor of restaurants where the writer's trying to eat, appearing at the foot of the bed first thing in the morning, etc. Hideously defective, hydrocephalic and noseless and flipper-armed and incontinent and idiotic and dribbling cerebrospinal fluid out of its mouth as it mules and blurbles and cries out to the writer, wanting love, wanting the very thing its hideousness guarantees it'll get, the writer's complete attention. The damaged infant trope is perfect because it captures the mix of repulsion and love the fiction writer feels for something he's working on. The fiction always comes out so horrifically defective, so hideous a betrayal of all your hopes for it, a cruel and repellent caricature of the perfection of its conception. Yes, understand, grotesque because imperfect. And yet it's yours. The infant is. It's you. And you love it, and dandle it, and wipe the cerebrospinal fluid off its slack chin with the cuff of the only clean shirt you have left. You have only one clean shirt left because you haven't done laundry in like three weeks because finally this one chapter or character seems like it's finally trembling on the edge of coming together and working, and you're terrified to spend any time on anything other than working on it, because if you look away for a second, you'll lose it, dooming the whole infant to continued hideousness. And but so you love the damaged infant and pity it and care for it, but also you hate it, hate it because it's deformed, repellent, because something grotesque has happened to it in the parturition from head to page. Hate it because its deformity is your deformity, since if you were a better fiction writer, your infant would of course look like one of those babies in catalog ads for infant wear, perfect, and pink, and cerebrospinally continent. And its every hideous, incontinent breath is a devastating indictment of you, on all levels. And so you want it dead, even as you dote and wipe it and dandle it and sometimes even apply CPR when it seems like its own grotesqueness has blocked its breath and it might die altogether. The whole thing's all very messed up and sad. But simultaneously, it's also tender and moving and noble and cool. It's a genuine relationship of a sort. And even at the height of its hideousness, the damaged infant somehow touches and awakens what you suspect are some of the very best parts of you. Maternal parts. Dark parts. You love your infant very much. And you want others to love it too. When the time finally comes for the damaged infant to go out and face the world. Foolish or fooling? So you're in a bit of a dicey position. You love the infant and you want others to love it, but that means that you hope others won't see it correctly. You want to sort of fool people. You want them to see as perfect what you in your heart know is a betrayal of all perfection. Or else you don't want to fool these people. What you want is you want them to see and love a lovely, miraculous, perfect, ad-ready infant, and to be right, correct, in what they see and feel. You want to be terribly wrong. You want the damaged infant's hideousness to turn out to have been nothing but your own weird delusion or hallucination. 
But that'd mean you were crazy. You have seen, been stalked by, and recoiled from hideous deformities that in fact others persuade you aren't there at all. Meaning you're at least a couple of fries short of a happy meal, surely. But worse, it'd mean you see and despise hideousness in a thing you made and love, in your spawn and in certain ways, you. And this last best hope this would represent something way worse than just very bad parenting. It'd be a terrible kind of self-assault, almost self-torture. But that's still what you most want, to be completely, insanely, suicidally wrong. Fun where you find it. But it's still a lot of fun. Don't get me wrong. As to the nature of that fun, I keep remembering this strange little story I heard in Sunday school when I was about the size of a fire hydrant. It takes place in China or Korea or someplace like that. It seems there was this old farmer outside a village in the hill country who worked his farm with his only son and his beloved horse. One day, the horse who is not only beloved, but vital to the labor-intensive work on the farm, picked the lock on his corral, or whatever, and ran off into the hills. All the old farmer's friends came around to exclaim what bad luck this was. The farmer only shrugged and said, Good luck, bad luck, who knows. A couple of days later, the beloved horse returned from the hills in the company of a whole priceless herd of wild horses, and the farmer's friends all came around to congratulate him on what good luck the horse's escape turned out to be. Good luck? Bad luck? Who knows? Is all the farmer says in reply, shrugging. The farmer now strikes me as a bit Yiddish sounding for an old Chinese farmer, but this is how I remember it. But so the farmer and his son set about breaking the wild horses, and one of the horses bucks the son off his back with such wild force that the son breaks his leg. And here come the friends to commiserate with the farmer and curse the bad luck that had ever brought these accursed horses onto the farm. The old farmer just shrugs and says, good luck, bad luck, who knows? A few days later, the Imperial Sino-Korean Army, or something like that, comes marching through the village, conscripting every able-bodied male between, like, 10 and 60 for cannon fodder for some hideously bloody conflict that's apparently brewing. But when they see the son's broken leg, they let him off on some sort of feudal 4F. And instead of getting shanghaied, the son stays on the farm with the old farmer. Good luck? Bad luck? This is the sort of parabolic straw you cling to as you struggle with the issue of fun as a writer. In the beginning, when you first start out trying to write fiction, the whole endeavor is about fun. You don't expect anybody else to read it. You're writing almost wholly to get yourself off to enable your own fantasies and deviant logics, and to escape or transform parts of yourself you don't like. And it works, and it's terrific fun. Then, if you have good luck and people seem to like what you do, you actually start to get paid for it, and get to see your stuff professionally typeset and bound and blurb and reviewed, and even, once, being read on the AM subway by a pretty girl you don't even know. It seems to make it even more fun. For a while. Then things start to get complicated and confusing, not to mention scary. Now you feel like you're writing for other people, or at least you hope so. You're no longer writing just to get yourself off, which, since any kind of masturbation is lonely and hollow, is probably good. But what replaces the onanistic motive? You've found you very much enjoy having your writing liked by people, and you find you're extremely keen to have people like the new stuff you're doing. 
The motive of pure personal starts to get supplanted by the motive of being liked, of having pretty people you don't know like you and admire you and think you're a good writer. Onanism gives way to attempted seduction as a motive. Now, attempted seduction is hard work, and its fun is offset by a terrible fear of rejection. Whatever ego means, your ego has now gotten into the game. Or maybe vanity is a better word. Because you notice that a good deal of your writing has now become basically showing off, trying to get people to think you're good. This is understandable. You have a great deal of yourself on the line, writing. Your vanity is at stake. You discover a tricky thing about fiction writing. A certain amount of vanity is necessary to be able to do it at all, but any vanity above a certain amount is lethal. At some point, you find that 90% of the stuff you're writing is motivated and informed by an overwhelming need to be liked. This results in shitty fiction, and the shitty work must get fed to the wastebasket, less because of any sort of artistic integrity than simply because shitty work will cause you to be disliked. At this point in the evolution of writerly fun, the very thing that's always motivated you to write is now also what's motivating you to feed your writing to the wastebasket. This is a paradox and a kind of double bind, and it can keep you stuck inside yourself for months or even years, during which period you will wail and gnash and rue your bad luck, and wonder bitterly where all of the fun of the thing could have gone. Try to remember. The smart thing to say, I think, is that the way out of this bind is to work your way somehow back to your original motivation, fun. And if you can find your way back to fun, you will find that the hideously unfortunate double bind of the late vain period turns out really to have been good luck for you. Because the fun you work back to has been transfigured by the extreme unpleasantness of vanity and fear, an unpleasantness you're now so anxious to avoid that the fun you rediscover is a way fuller and more large-hearted kind of fun. It has something to do with work as play or with the discovery that disciplined fun is more than impulsive or hedonistic fun, or with figuring out that not all paradoxes have to be paralyzing. Under fun's new administration, writing fiction becomes a way to go deep inside yourself and to illuminate precisely the stuff you don't want to see or let anyone else see. And this stuff usually turns out, paradoxically, to be precisely the stuff all writers and readers everywhere share and respond to, feel. Fiction becomes a weird way to countenance yourself and to tell the truth instead of being a way to escape yourself or to present yourself in a way you figure will be maximally likable. This process is complicated and confusing and scary and also hard work but it turns out to be the best fun there is. The fact that you can now sustain the writing of fun only by confronting the very same unfun parts of yourself you'd first use writing to avoid or disguise is another kind of paradox. But this one isn't any kind of bind at all. What it is, is a gift, a kind of miracle. And compared to it, the reward of stranger's affection is as dust lint. Thanks for listening.